EJ Jr., welcome back to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I hope you're doing well, sir. I'm blessed, Brian. How are you doing? I am doing very well and looking forward to talking some Alabama football with you. And, uh, you know, it's it's right now we're about 93 days away from Alabama and teeing up against Florida State, which will be a big opponent. All right, yeah. I mean, I think it's going to be an exciting game. You know, the irony is, is I'm, the, I'm the defensive line coach at Delaware State, and we played Florida State the last game of the season. Wow, I did, I, did, I did not know that, okay? So uh, help me understand it from a coaching perspective. When you're this far out, what's going through your mind as you prepare for the summer and the conditioning and you've got your seven-on-seven? Seven. Walk us through from a coaching perspective with, with 93 days out. Well, I mean, you're preparing for it and trying to make sure all your guys are, that are coming in are, are getting ready for summer school, all-season conditioning programs, fall workouts. Uh, trying to make sure all your eyes are dotted, T's across. We want them to basically be in the best shape now. All all the insurances and things are done. The coaches are also preparing for the, the 2018 recruiting season, the 2019 recruiting season. Looking at the boards, breaking down film, uh, looking at the first, the last three opponents of your 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 opponent that you're facing in in um, September. So you're going through all those processes. You're really trying to break down the first three games of the season. Uh, so you can kind of get a uh, jump on everybody, uh, evaluating your players. Uh, so there's a lot of things that are going on 93 days before the first game, uh, summer school. So, you know, make sure your guys are remaining eligible, staying healthy. So there, there's quite a bit of, of things that you're getting prepared for this time of the season. So you're still busy. And then you try to get a little bit of vacation time somewhere in the midst of all that. EJ, what is the biggest difference between when you were playing the game of college football and now that you're coaching it when you look at the current day? What's the biggest difference? Social media. <laughs> really? Okay, uh, help me, help me. I, I, I would say because when, when you back when you when I was playing, you didn't have to worry about Facebook, you didn't have to worry about Twitter, you didn't have to worry about uh, the, the, the cell phones taking pictures, what your kids were doing. Uh, pretty much you were in summer school, your guys were uh, working, if they were there for summer school, they were working out. Uh, there wasn't such as much scrutiny uh, back then as there is now. Uh, I think kids could be have more fun focusing on football and the game at hand and then trying to figure out how to be popular, what's going on in everyday lives. You know, because so you have to be careful what you say, the things that you do, uh, how you're perceived in public. You know, you can't go anywhere without somebody taking pictures of something happening here, there, everywhere. So I think social media has changed how the game is played now because there's so much there's so much access to what you're doing behind the scenes uh, that changes the flow of what coaches are trying to do. I think we were pretty much sheltered and protected back when I was playing, but now everything is you know open to the public. Everybody can look at seeing what you're doing or trying to get some kind of information and and, and Everything is scrutinized. I mean, if you make a mistake, it's, it's going to be all over the place. Uh, so I think that's the biggest difference now than compared to when I played in the late 70s. How about on the field? O- on the field, uh, what's the biggest difference? <laughs> the kids are a lot bigger, stronger, faster, and hopefully the, the football IQ is a lot higher. But um, I think one of the things that kind of hurt the, the, the new brand of kids is now that you can leave uh, for the NFL a little bit earlier, uh, you got video games, things that can distract them a lot more. But these kids now, bigger, stronger, fast. I got a son who's at uh, Bowling Green who's 6'5", 285, and it just blows my mind uh, how well he can move in space. And, and you know, I got another one who's 14, who's 5'10", who's, uh, 175. So the kids are getting bigger, they're getting stronger. They're getting more coaching. They're more caps available for them to, to test their skills, combines that they can go to. Whereas, you know, when I was in high school, we didn't even do off-season conditioning program. We were in track. You played basketball. You played baseball. And then you had a little bit of free time in the summer before you started doing all over. It's now an 11-month-a-year sport. And you're focusing on your conditioning, staying in shape, and trying to get better. 
We are talking right now to EJ Jr., All-American linebacker at the University of Alabama, as we try to recognize a championship each week, and we're recognizing that 1979 team. It is our championship countdown presented by Southern L House. Let me go to that 1975, and I know this may be a general question, but what was so special about that football team? I think the biggest thing is that we wanted the each class. Each class wanted to be better than the year before. My freshman year, we had missed out on the national championship. That's when they jumped Notre Dame from fifth to first. And then the next year, uh, when Barry Krause and, and that crew was, were seniors, we ended up winning the national championship with the goal line stand versus Penn State. Uh, so the 79 team going into that season, Dominic and Hill, Dwight Stevenson, those guys, uh, uh, <laughs> senior year, I think we were more focused on wanting to make sure that we could go back and repeat. It was a whole different uh group of kids, as Coach Bryant said, when we first it's not the same team as it was the year before. Uh, I think there was a, 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 a mentality that we wanted to make sure we were outright winners. We knew the schedule would be tough. Uh, did not know that we were going to be playing Arkansas at the end of the year, but there were some things that we had, we had to try to overcome uh, going into the, the, the 1979 season, but I think we were more experienced. I think we, we finally got over that hurdle of winning. wanted to make sure that we did not go back so uh, there was a big focus, especially on the defensive side of the ball. You had Major Ogilvy, Billy Jackson coming into their own. So I think it was a fun group to be around. Uh, and most of us stayed there because we wanted to be uh, national champions again. When I go back to talking about national champs, and I think you can understand uh, where Alabama is right now because you came through a decade and probably one of the most dominant decades in college football history in the 70s in the championships. But I want to talk about the expectation of winning a national title. Did that pressure ever get to you that that was the goal every single year it was national championship or bust? I, I think my mindset was is that we wanted to win the SEC. And if we won the SEC, that we, you know, we wanted to take it one game at a time. But we wanted to win the conference, and we wanted to basically win each game, each week, each battle. Uh, and when when you got to the end of the season, because you know you were voted back then, it wasn't that you had a championship game, but you were voted at the end of the year, either by AP or UPI or the the, the coaches association, who was the best team. So there were a lot of a lot of polls that you could win. But I think that it's easier to be the hunted. I mean, be the hunter than being the hunted. And it's where you started at the beginning of the year. And I think going into the 1979 season, I think we were ranked number one going in. So it was a little bit different than the year before, where I think they had Southern Cal was going to be uh, was rated the enough the preseason number one team. So we were more of a hunter. It was a little more pressure being the hunted. In 1979, where I think we were ranked number one going into the season. Help us pay respect to Ken Donahue. I, I know he was the defensive coordinator here for 20 years, but he was just inducted uh, into the Alabama Sports Hall of Fame a couple of weeks ago. I'd help you. Maybe you could help us pay respect to Ken Donahue. Ken Donahue, in my opinion, was the greatest defensive coordinator that I've ever been around. As far as not understanding the college game, I don't think there was a game plan that he and um, Bill Oliver, Sylvester Croom, Jeff Rousey, and Paul Crane in my earlier years uh, put together a game plan each week that was we could execute. We could, you know, they were we were prepared mentally, physically. There was we always expected the unexpected, and as much as as he was a coordinator, he also was a great person who was in condition. So during all season conditioning program, Coach Donahue ran with us and practically could outrun most of us. Uh, so you didn't want to be in the back because Coach Donahue said, don't be last, don't be last, and you're constantly pushing yourself, and you look up and you see Coach Donahue behind you, oh, I'm not running fast enough because he had to be at least 30, 40 years out senior, and he can run just as well as we could. What is the story that you share with your with your players there at Delaware State uh, about Coach Bryant? I mean, because I, I love the Coach Bryant stories. We're always on the edge of our seat. They never get tired. Uh, some here in Tuscaloosa. We love them. I hope you'll share one with us. Well, Coach Bryant was a, a father figure. He was a mentor. He was a, a philosopher. And he coached the coaches. And I think that's what somewhat uh, what, 
what Coach Carter, Kenneth Carter does it with us. He lets us coach the players. He coaches us on what he expects us to do. But one of the stories that kind of, you know, uh, I always have flashbacks is always dealing with the all-season conditioning program. When Coach uh, Brian had Coach Goostry oversee that program, and our all-season conditioning program here is pretty tough. And I always have flashbacks of the lower gym. Now, we don't have a lower gym here at Delaware State. But we do have a, a conditioning coach who reminds me of Coach Goose Street, uh, that military mind that says, gentlemen, this is the Alabama off-season conditioning program. And if you look in the lower gym, there are four giant trash cans inside there, four giant <laughs> trash bags. That's for you who can't make it through the first 15 minutes. Because then we're going to run and run and run until you throw up. You're going to catch your breath, and then we're going to run some more. Now we're going to start off with the big 21. That 21 push up, 21 sit up, 21 squat thrust for those who don't know what a first beat is. Then we're going to do 19. Then we're going to do 17. We're going to do 15. We're going to skip 13, jump down to 11, do 9. And then we're going to go back and do the 13 to see if you got anything left in the tank. Then we're going to finish with the 5, 3, and we're going to get to 1. That's before we do any kind of run. And we get started on By the time we get through with the first step, you know, my arms are shaking. I said, we're going to die. And Coach Biden says, ah, oh, you're just getting warmed up. Y'all haven't done anything. Let's start all over for the beginning. And he would start us all over. Like, we're going to really die today. And but the thing with Coach Bryant, all he would have to do is just look at you. He wouldn't say anything in those off-season conditioning programs. He'd just look at you. And either you're going to make it or you weren't going to make it. And he didn't bring you there by excuse. So if you were there... You were going to push yourself. And I think Coach Saban is probably the same way. He does. Coach Saban, I don't think, he says a lot. I think he just looks at you. And I think that's one of the things that I kind of look at my player. I don't have to say much. They know what I expect from them. I just look at them and say, uh, back in the day, you all don't understand how we used to do these things. This is a piece of cake. You all can't do 21 push-ups without me trying to fuck. And I'm not going to fall from grace today. <laughs> <laughs> so Coach Brian has a lot of influence. All I want to do is just look at him. I said, when I start talking, you know you're in trouble. EJ, how many – when we're talking right now with the All-American uh, from the University of Alabama on two national championship teams, EJ Jr. right now, how often do you catch yourself saying things that remind you of Coach Bryant? Every day. <laughs> okay. Either him or I'll say something that Coach Kroon would say, something that Sylvester, uh, Coach Donahue would say. It, it's hard because you were taught by these men. And back then, sometimes it didn't make sense. But when you get older, it makes a lot of sense because it fits into the philosophy of being a successful person. Coach Bryant could make an average person good. He could make a good player great. He could make a great player exceptional. And, you know, I was blessed and honored to be able to play for him for four years and, uh, you know, go on. I've been nominated for the College Football Hall of Fame last year, and I just thought, well, I'm on the ballot again this year, and I, I'm just blessed that, that you know, I get an opportunity to, to represent the, the University of Alabama. But I'm only a great player because I have some great guys to play around me. EJ, when you look back and and you think about uh, Alabama football, and you know you, you look back at that '79 season, I mean, I was just looking through the names just a couple of minutes ago, and and, and looking uh, at the shutouts that you guys were able to throw up. I, I think it was five that season. Uh, you only allowed two teams. Now think about this in current college football: two teams to reach double digits. That that's crazy. That the defense was so dominant in 1979. The defense, basically, I, I think the th biggest thing about Alabama football, even in that era, we prided ourselves on defense. Uh, and the more we prided, I, championships are always won by defense. I really didn't know it back in the day. Uh, as, as I pay attention to it more and more as I got older, you know, you have the flash and the, the, the fury of the offense. But if your defense is not solid, if your defense is not a swarming group of guys who want to punish the ball carrier, uh, you're not you you you're you're fooling yourself. And the biggest thing with our defense is that we had guys behind us who were just as good as when we started. And I do remember there are times that Coach Bryant could have started the second team defense called the Aces or the second team offense called the Jets and could have won with them. But our defense, when I when you got look at my backup, I had Mike Pitts as a backup. 
you know, John Morrow was a backup when you had Gary De Niro playing with him. So you had some great guys who, you know, Wayne Hamilton was playing. So we, we, we worried about who was going to steal our job if we didn't fall, if we fell short. And then we also, back in those days, we had training tables. Training table was the elite meal of those guys who earn the, the 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 high grades in playing in that game, and that's when you got the steaks and the lobsters and the things like that. And you wanted to eat the the the, the training table than just eat the regular cafeteria. Not to say that the regular cafeteria food in, in Bryant Hall was bad, but just making training table and being able to eat steak or lobsters or or barbecue ribs, or whatever your choice was that day, uh, be, be eating the regular food in the cafeteria. So that was something else that always pushed the defense. We knew Coach Bryant always looked for us to to be able to win games and and do the best because we were physical on the field in practice and during the season. So when we got to a game, it was easy. EJ, final couple of questions here. When you look at uh... – the freshman just reported on campus at the University of Alabama just a couple of days ago, and we were playing a Coach Bryant clip, uh, that first meeting with a freshman and sort of laying out the expectations and, you know, the things that he wanted you to accomplish while you were at Alabama. Do you remember uh, just reporting to the University of Alabama when you first arrived on campus as a true freshman? Uh, I do, and it's a little bit different now because we didn't report during the summer, the, the summer school sessions. Whereas they get an early start on things now. When I came in, we came in in August. Uh, we had 11 days of two a day, three days of, of what you call shells and helmets before you got into the full gear. And we started practice in August. You know, your first class wasn't until September. And, you know, it was, it, we had true two a day. So the, our conditioning test was a mile and a half run, and we had to make it within nine minutes and 30 seconds. That was everybody. And then you got into the football, and you just wondered. You know, you see all those great guys. I mean, I saw Barry Krause. We had Rich Wingo. And I was I came in as a blue-chip linebacker, not knowing that I was going to end up being a, a defensive end because we had such depth at linebacker, they moved me to different positions to see where I could fit. And I was willing to go wherever uh, – to play, but I didn't know I was going to be able to be a, a freshman uh, player or even start as a freshman. Uh, I just wanted an opportunity to compete, and that's what Coach Bryant always challenged us, and that's the, that was the biggest thing that Coach Bryant always told us day in and day out. If you compete, you'll play. And that's what we did, everybody from the top to the bottom. I don't care if you were uh, at that time going into the junior year, if you were Don McNeil, or if you were Dante Bramlett, who was a home, I mean, was a freshman coming in that year, you were going to compete, and if you were going to compete, you were going to fly. 